infrastructure and elsewhere in Scotland. Thank you. That concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one from Jackson Carlaw. Thank you, Presiding Officer. After months, years even, of sanctimony from the First Minister and her Brexit Secretary, uh, first, uh, Jackson, yesterday, Mr. Carlo, Mr. Carlo, I'm just going to suspend. I'm going to sus suspend proceedings for a few moments. Right. Proceedings are suspended. Uh, thank you very much, colleagues. We'll resume business and we'll start again with question number one from Jackson Carlaw. And, and if we're not to be a fortress, presiding officer, we have to be prepared to accept that demonstrations are a democratic right and we have to be prepared for that. <laughs> but I've given it away. After months, years even of sanctimony from the First Minister and her Brexit Secretary, yesterday SNP MPs refused to back the very policy option they have been demanding. <laughs> Isn't it, isn't, it, isn't it the case that what Scotland saw yet again yesterday is that when push comes to shove for the SNP, it's not about finding a solution to Brexit, it's about pursuing their independence obsession. First Minister. Sorry, Presiding Officer, it's, it's hard not to laugh. The, the Tory yeah. Secretary of State for Scotland abstained on every single option <laughs> in the House of Commons last night. <laughs> but as Jackson Carlaw uh, rightly says, and, and indeed belatedly recognises, for two long years, uh, when stopping Brexit didn't seem possible, the SNP argued for single market customs union membership compromise. That was ignored by the Tories and indeed by everybody else. Now, that option, which I think is the minimum you would need to protect Scotland's interests, wasn't actually on the ballot paper last night. Uh, that said, over the next few days, we will continue to work across Parliament for a compromise of that nature, if that proves to be the only alternative to a hard Brexit. But let me also say this, Presiding Officer, this whole process, thanks to the Tories, is now such a mess yeah. that stopping Brexit altogether must be our top priority. Yeah. And moreover... Moreover, that is now possible. Actually, the highest number of votes cast in the House of Commons last night was for the people's vote option. Yes. So, you know, the principles that's guided everything we've done in this is the protection of Scotland's interests. I wonder if Jackson Carlaw can tell us what principles have guided the Scottish Tories, because it seems to me uh, the only principle they've been abiding by is doing whatever the London bosses have told them to do. Yes. Succinctly, please. There, Jackson there was no principle in the way the SNP voted last yeah, night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what I saw in contrast was a Prime Minister prepared to set aside her own premiership to secure a deal. Yeah. A deal which, contrary to everything the SNP says, will be good for Scotland and will be good for the UK. And by contrast, here's the First Minister's record. She angrily demands that the Prime Minister go. She angrily commands when the Prime Minister does go. She angrily then declares that the Prime Minister's decision to go, you guessed it, makes the case for independence. Full outrage, grievance, her own one single-minded obsession. Aren't Scots right to detect just a little bit of a pattern here, First Minister? More succinctly, please, First Minister. Well, I, again, you know, you have to laugh that Jackson Carlow is coming here today and raising the position of the Prime Minister. You know, it's traditional in politics, it's traditional... Uh, for leaders to say to colleagues, you know, if you don't back me on an issue of such importance, I might have to resign. Not in the Tories, though. Theresa May's position is if you don't back me, I'll stay. <laughs> you know, Theresa May must be the only leader 
uh, in living memory who has tried to fall on her own sword and has managed to miss. <laughs> it is utterly ridiculous. Now, the SNP, uh, the SNP, in contrast to the Tories, will continue to stand up for Scotland's interests. That's what we have done since day one uh, after the Brexit yeah. referendum. And the way to stand up, not just for Scotland's interests, but the way to stand up for the interests of the entire UK right now is to recognise that this Brexit process is a complete and utter mess yeah. and put this issue back to the people. So belatedly, can Jackson Carlaw find it within himself to actually stand up for Scotland instead of being the last man standing up for Theresa May? Yeah. <laughs> Jackson Carlaw. Presiding officer, Nicola Sturgeon doesn't stand up for the Scottish interest, she stands up for the nationalist interest. Yeah, 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 yeah. On Monday, on Monday, the Prime Minister said she was sceptical that yesterday's trawl through the alternatives would produce an outcome. She was right. For the avoidance of doubt, no deal was rejected. A second referendum was rejected again. Yep. Revoking Article 50 was rejected. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, when it came to the crunch, the First Minister whipped her MPs against supporting her own policy of a customs union and single market membership, and that was defeated, and that was defeated too. Doesn't the result of these votes demonstrate that Alex Neil and Jim Sillers are right? The best way forward to secure an orderly withdrawal is to support the Prime Minister's deal. Yes. First Minister, more succinctly, please. Well, as I say, the compromise position uh, that the SNP put forward when it looked as if Remain wasn't an option, which is not the case now, incidentally, wasn't on the ballot paper last night. It has never been our position to accept just a customs union. Yeah, right. That would not be sufficient to protect Scotland's yeah. interests. Uh, but I disagree with Jackson Carlaw in his characterisation of what happened last night, because if you look at two of the options, yes, a customs union alone, uh, but also a second referendum, both of those options got more votes in the House of Commons last night than the Prime Minister's yeah. deal has managed on either of the occasions yeah. it's been brought forward and defeated. So actually, I think uh, that does give the House of Commons something to move forward with into next week. Um, and no, I don't think the thing to do now is to vote for a bad deal. Uh, a bad deal that would take Scotland out of the EU, out of the single market and out of the customs union. The right thing to do now is to put this issue back to the people. And I'll say again, if Jackson Carlaw was interested in actually standing up for Scotland, or indeed the interests of the UK, that's the option he would be arguing for too. Jackson Carlaw. The argument for many against the Prime Minister's deal is that there was support for an alternative. The votes in the House of Commons last night demonstrated that there is not. It's clear that there is a deal, one which secures an orderly way forward. One supported by Jean-Claude Juncker, supported by Donald Tusk, supported by 27 of our other EU partners, backed by the business community here in Scotland, by the whisky industry, by our fishermen. That's the Prime Minister's deal. Surely after all the confusion, with every other alternative being rejected yesterday, the national interest is served by supporting that compromise. Surely it's time to back the deal and get on with it. Yeah. First Minister. You know, the, the Prime Minister's deal may be or may not be backed by all of the people that Jackson Carlow has just listed there. The problem is the Prime Minister's deal, the Prime Minister's deal is not backed by his own party. And that's why she cannot get it through. Even if every single SNP MP was to have backed the Prime Minister's deal, it would still have gone down to massive defeat. It is time that the Prime Minister and her uh, sole remaining defender, Jackson Carlow, or sole remaining defenders, the Scottish Tories, uh, yeah. accepted that that deal is dead and it is now time to move on to another option. The option that got most votes last night in the House of Commons was the people's votes. That's the right thing to do. And again, what we see today is Jackson Carlaw failing to stand up for Scotland's interests and simply standing up for Theresa May and his London bosses. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Presiding officer, the Prime Minister's answer to Commons gridlock and Brexit meltdown is to offer to resign again. But while MPs can't make a decision, too many people in the real world have no choice but day in and day out to make heartbreaking decisions as a result of a decade of Tory austerity. 
decisions like paying the bills or feeding their children. And the result, over half a million food parcels were handed out in Scotland over the past 18 months. So does the First Minister agree with me that Brexit isn't the only reason why Theresa May must go? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do. Um, and I look back a few years to 2014 and I reflect on the fact that if Labour hadn't teamed up with the Tories to stop Scotland becoming independent, we wouldn't have had a Tory Prime Minister for these last few years. Richard Leonard. All right. Order, please. Richard Leonard. Well, the, um, the First Minister was teaming up with some interesting people at the weekend, I noticed. Um, and I know. And I know. Order, please. Order, please. Thank you. That's constitutional politics. So, let's keep the noise down, please. I Order, please. Richard Leonard. Uh, the, the, fir <laughs> the First Minister and I may differ on some things, but we share some frustrations about the Brexit process, not least in how it is detracting from all of those other issues that really matter to people. Issues like jobs, like schools and hospitals, issues like child poverty. In October last year, the First Minister told me that she would not support Labour's plan to increase child benefit by £5 a week because her government estimated that it would lift only 20,000 children out of poverty. New figures for child poverty were published by the Scottish Government this morning. So can the First Minister tell the Chamber how many more children in Scotland are now living in poverty? First Minister. Child poverty, uh, if we look at the figures this morning, has uh, increased and I think that is deeply regrettable. We know why it's increasing, uh, because of the welfare cuts and the austerity being imposed by Tory governments. Yeah. Child poverty and poverty generally in Scotland is too high, although it's important to note uh, that it's lower in Scotland than it is in either England or indeed Labour run Wales. Uh, but nevertheless, it is because child poverty is too high that we are firstly taking steps to mitigate the impact of Tory welfare cuts. It's why we are taking uh, steps to invest in reducing child poverty. And of course, it's why uh, we are committed to the introduction of an income supplement, but one that lifts more children out of poverty by making sure we target that resource to those who most need it. And when we uh, publish the way forward on that by uh, June this year, I hope we'll get uh, Scottish Labour support for it. Richard Leonard. Uh, Presiding officer, this morning's figures show that 10,000 more children in Scotland are living in poverty. That means almost a quarter of a million children in Scotland are living in poverty today. No wonder Dr Mary MacLeod from the uh, uh, anti-poverty project A Menu for Change says that the Scottish Government must, and I quote her, give people living on cups of tea and thin air more to sustain them, and they must do it now or that the Child Poverty Action Group says that, and I quote them, the Scottish Government's timetable for a new income supplement fails to reflect the extraordinary increase in child poverty that the country faces. Children in poverty really can't wait until 2022. So First Minister, can you tell us why are you making these children wait? First Minister. We are doing the work to make sure that we have a policy that can be delivered, a policy that can be paid for, and a policy that lifts the maximum number of children out of poverty. Now, this is a week in which uh, Labour's uh, most recent policy announcement on bus travel has been exposed uh, as completely uh, unworked through. It is not fair to promise people things that you cannot deliver. And we will not do that. We will take forward plans that can be delivered. Uh, in terms of uh, our action now uh, to tackle poverty, you know, we are investing uh, £125 million a year to mitigate the worst impacts of Tory 
policy. Uh, we heard what the UN uh, Rapporteur in Poverty had to say uh, when he said that the Scottish Government devolved administrations in general uh, are mitigating the worst impacts of austerity uh, despite experiencing significant reductions in block grant funding um, and limits on their ability to raise revenue. But mitigation comes at a price and is not sustainable. So what we will continue to do is take real action. And what we will also continue to do is demand that the powers that the Tories are now using to impose these policies in Scotland are actually brought to this Parliament. And the sooner Richard Leonard supports us in that, the better. And we have some constituency supplementaries. The first from Gordon Lindhurst. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of recent national statistics data showing Edinburgh has the worst pupil-teacher ratio in Scotland, and this has steadily worsened since the SNP came to power. Now, the First Minister asked to be judged on her record on education, so what assurances can she give that more will be done to reverse this trend and meet the individual needs of pupils in Edinburgh who are being let down by her government? First Minister. Well, pupil-teacher ratios across the country are broadly stable. We also see teacher numbers overall increasing uh, over the past few years. I think we've got the highest number uh, of teachers overall now than has been the case since 2010, and the highest number of primary school teachers since 1980, which uh, was when I was still at primary school. We also see attainment uh, in our schools uh, increasing, and we are seeing uh, the attainment gap uh, close. So that is good progress, and it is progress that we are determined to continue. Emma Harper. Thank you. I have uh, written to the Home Secretary and the Scottish Government Minister for Migration seek an urgent intervention to prevent six of my constituents, the Sabita family, from being imminently deported from Dumfries to Tunisia. The family, four of whom are under 16, are being deported simply on the basis that they cannot afford to pay the almost £7,000 fee for the Home Office to pr process their application. The family are now reporting to the police every week until their deportation and are unable to work, study or make money for themselves. Can I therefore ask the First Minister, in the absence of any fast action from the local Tory MP, what advice she is able to offer me to support my constituents and whether there is any action the Scottish Government can take to help my constituents constituents remain in Scotland. First Minister. Well, can I thank uh, Emma Harper for raising uh, this case and I think what she has just outlined there uh, is an illustration of uh, Tory run Britain. It is absolutely shocking and appalling and the Tories sitting over there I think should be ashamed of it. Um, I am hugely sympathetic to all those and we're talking about many people here who have real difficulties navigating uh, the complex and the increasingly restrictive UK immigration rules. Uh, the Scottish Government welcomes and we hugely value people from all over the world who choose to build their lives here. Uh, Scotland is stronger because of our multiculturalism and non-UK citizens are an essential part, not just of our present, but also of our future. Uh, the UK Government's immigration system is not fit for purpose. Uh, we want to see a less restrictive, more humane system that meets our needs and also provides a welcoming environment for new Scots and their families. Uh, the Migration Minister will make representations to the Home Office and respond to Ms Harper as soon as possible. Edward Mountain to be followed by Gillian Martin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will know that from Monday, air traffic controllers working for HIAL are starting their work to rule, which will have severe results and as far as disruption are concerned. On the 26th of April, proposed strike action will close seven airports for 24 hours. Given the importance of air travel to businesses, families in the Highlands and Islands, can she confirm what contingency plans the Scottish Government have in place to help? First Minister. Well, I'm extremely disappointed uh, about the planned strike action. Um, Highlands and Islands airports, uh, of course, are covered by our public sector pay policy. Um, Hyle has implemented a pay rise for all staff, which is an improvement on previous years and has also significantly increased its contribution to uh, the pension scheme in order to maintain this benefit for employees. Um, this issue is uh, now, I understand, going to ACAS, uh, and I hope very much that we will see an early resolution of it uh, so that uh, the travelling public uh, do not suffer any unnecessary disruption. Julian Martin to be followed by Mark MacDonald. 
Thank you, President Officer. This week, the Instant Neighbour Charity published some startling figures on a stark increase in people in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire receiving emergency food parcels from food banks, with 12 independent food banks distributing over 27,000 parcels in the last 18 months. Would the First Minister give her assessment on why we're seeing such an increase and what can be done to stop the rise in food bank use in an area where everyone should be thriving? First Minister. Well, the latest data uh, showing the number of food banks uh, and number of emergency food parcels uh, does show these numbers as being far too high. Uh, the Scottish Government promotes an approach to tackling food insecurity that has dignity at its heart. We support Fair Share, for example, to help build better community resilience. And as I've just said uh, in response to Richard Leonard, uh, we are doing everything we can to mitigate the impact of the welfare cuts and the austerity being imposed in Scotland uh, that are the driving factors behind this increase in food bank uh, use. So in answer to Gillian Martin's question, uh, that is the reason uh, we will, in Scot the Scottish Government, continue to do everything we can to mitigate it. Uh, but the sooner we can tackle these issues at source, the better by taking these decisions here in our own parliament. And Mark MacDonald. Uh, I previously raised the issue of Stonywood Mill in my constituency entering administration. Since then, a phenomenal collective effort involving workforce, management, unions and local and national agencies has sought to present a clear message that the mill has a positive future. It's reported today that a preferred bidder has been identified and while there is still some distance to travel, does the First Minister agree that this is strong testament to that united approach which will hopefully secure a bright future for the business and its 482 strong workforce? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do agree with that. Uh, we've had some positive news uh, this week, as Mark MacDonald has just outlined, although I think he's absolutely right uh, to also be cautious. There is a long way to go. Uh, but I do think the positive news that we've had about the preferred bidder is firstly testament to uh, the skills and the dedication of the workforce, uh, but also testament to that joint collective effort, which will very much continue now to make sure that Stonywood Mill uh, does have a very positive future. And question number three, Alison Johnson. Thank you. It's clear that the First Minister shares my grave concern that the Scottish Government and Resolution Foundation analysis confirms that the number of children living in poverty in Scotland is steadily rising. And it's clear that she shares my anger and frustration too that this worrying rise, in the words of the senior economic analysis, an analyst at the Resolution Foundation, is almost entirely driven by UK-wide decisions. So while we continue to call for an end to the mean-spirited, punitive welfare policies of the UK government, it's clear that the Scottish government must do all that it can to raise the living standards of our poorest families. But is the First Minister really saying that low-income families in Scotland will have to wait until 2022 before the Scottish government introduces a desperately needed income supplement? First Minister. Firstly, I agree with Alison Johnson's sentiments. Uh, as we have said, we will set out an update on this work by June this year, um, and that will be available for Parliament as a whole to scrutinise and to debate. Uh, that will uh, be published alongside our analysis of policy and delivery options. And these are important aspects. Delivery option, as well as how we pay for uh, this policy, is a vital part of making sure uh, that it can be delivered properly. Um, and also, in terms of uh, what drives uh, some of our work behind this, uh, there's two principles in particular. Firstly, reaching the greatest number of children in poverty and topping up income sufficiently to lift those households out of poverty. In terms of uh, the Give Me Five campaign, which I've got a lot of sympathy for the organisations uh, behind that, uh, what we do see is that seven pounds out of every 10 pounds of that uh, would be spent on families not living in poverty. If we're going to do this, which we are committed to doing, we must make sure that the money gets to those most in need. Alison Johnson. Thank you. I thank the First Minister for her response. Living up to the targets that this Parliament unanimously supported in the Child Poverty Act must be a priority. So we have to use every single tool that we have at our disposal. The Resolution Foundation's report on child poverty says, and I'm quoting, it is possible that replacing the current regressive system of council tax, as cross-party talks are set to discuss, could help reduce child poverty if done right. Will the First Minister commit to ensuring our local and national tax systems are significantly more progressive, 
allowing us to raise the money we need to fight child poverty in Scotland. First Minister. Well, of course, we're already uh, raising extra revenue through a more progressive system of <coughs> income tax, which I think is something the Greens uh, welcome, even if it's not something uh, every party across this chamber welcomes. Uh, as Alison Johnson has already referred to, we have uh, committed to cross-party talks on reform of the council tax, and I hope all parties will agree to take part in that, and certainly putting the progressive principle at the heart of that should be a priority and an objective for all of us. We have some further supplementaries. The first from Maurice Corey. The First Minister joined me in welcoming the excellent announcement from the Prime Minister yesterday that our armed forces men and women serving in Scotland on a tour of duty will now receive financial recompense from the UK Government in the tax year 2019-20 as a result of the increase in tax rates imposed by this SNP Government last year. First Minister. I was... Uh... <laughs> I was just wondering there which welcome announcement of the Prime Minister uh, he was going to ask me to welcome uh, there. Uh, but on this one, uh, it's interesting, isn't it, that the Tories uh, talk about uh, those in our armed forces who, because of our progressive uh, system of income tax, uh, those paid uh, more highly pay a little bit more tax in Scotland. Uh, what we don't hear the Tories talking about are the estimated 37,000 yeah. MOD personnel in England, the lower paid uh, people who are now paying more tax uh, than their counterparts in Scotland do. Now, interestingly, I haven't heard any suggestion that the Tories are going to compensate them for the fact they're paying more tax in England than they would be if they were based here in Scotland. Nor do I hear the Tories saying that they're going to compensate MOD personnel in England uh, for the free prescriptions that their counterparts yeah. in Scotland yeah. get, or their access to free education if they're ordinarily resident in Scotland uh, that people in England don't get. So uh, MOD personnel, just as every public sector worker uh, in Scotland gets a far better deal uh, than their counterparts in England, and that's something the Tories should be reflecting long and hard on. And Rona Mackay. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, Theresa May offered up her own resignation as, a, as an attempt to win support for her deal, and even that doesn't seem to have been enough. Does the First Minister think it's high time the Prime Minister accepted her deal is finished and Article 50 should be revoked to put a stop to this chaos? Here, here. First Minister. Uh, yes. It seems to me that, uh, apart from Theresa May, the only people who don't uh, see that her deal is completely dead are the Scottish Conservatives. It's time to move on to better options. I've made my view clear on a people's vote. But interestingly, the House of Commons uh, last night uh, had the option to emphatically uh, rule out no deal by saying uh, that in that uh, scenario uh, they would choose to revoke Article 50 instead. Joanna Cherry uh, from the SNP put that amendment down uh, last night. And interestingly, uh, I think perhaps, uh, I need to double check this, I think perhaps with one exception, all of the Scottish uh, Tories uh, voted in a way that would suggest that they would prefer no deal Brexit uh, to actually revoking Article 50. I think that is inexplicable when we see the damage that no deal would do to Scotland. And yet another example of the Tories being uh, way, way, way out of sync with Scotland's national interests. And Murder Fraser. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Last week, Perth College UHI announced the closure of its learning centres in Kinross, Creef and Blairgowrie. Does the First Minister share my concern that this uh, short-sighted decision will do serious damage to rural education opportunities in Perth and Kinross? And what role does she think the real terms cut in funding of 3.2% to the budget of UHI played in that decision? First Minister. Well, of course, uh, we have in our budget overall, we've increased uh, funding to colleges and to universities. Interestingly, of course, Murdo Fraser and his colleagues voted against uh, that budget. But in terms of the particular issue that he raises, I do share his concerns uh, and I know uh, that local members have been raising these concerns uh, and will continue to do so. And Stuart Stevenson. Has the First Minister noted that the vote of an individual democratic unionist is worth over £100 million, but the opinion of this parliament is worth nothing, and similarly the Cardiff parliament? How does the First Minister respond to that? First Minister. I don't think it will be 
I don't think it will be lost on many people across Scotland that the, a handful of DUP MPs right now <laughs> appear to have more say over Scotland's future yeah. than the democratically yeah. elected <laughs> Parliament of Scotland yeah. does. And that is absolutely disgraceful. Uh, but I don't think it should be lost on the Scottish Tories. The, the DUP appear to be able to get all of this money out of the Prime Minister. There's more Scottish Tories than there are DUP <laughs> MPs. So why are they not managing to get anything for Scotland? Because the Scottish Tories never managed to do anything for Scotland, ever. <laughs> and question number four, Emma Harper. To ask the First Minister what progress has been made with the implement, implementation of Frank's law. First well, I'm absolutely delighted to confirm that the extension of free personal care uh, to those under 65 assessed as requiring it will begin on Monday, uh, with £30 million of new investment being delivered uh, in our budget for 2019-20. We've been working with COSLA, local authorities and stakeholders to ensure that this will be successfully implemented. Emma Harper. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer and I can, I, can I welcome the expansion and step change in the provision in personal care with the benefit not only to those in the south of Scotland who require care but people across all of Scotland. When free personal care was first introduced in the UK, the, the UK government clawed back monies that were being spent on attendance allowance. With the extension of free personal care, has the UK government given any commitment not to consequentially cut the disability benefits for people who do receive free personal care? First Minister. Uh, no, there's been no such commitment from the UK government, unfortunately. Uh, when we were bringing forward the necessary steps to put the extension in place, we did call on the UK government not to cut these disability benefits, uh, but unfortunately they rejected those calls. Uh, our actions in uh, extension will ensure that no one is left out of pocket by the UK government withdrawing the care elements of DLA or PIP. Uh, but the Tories, I think, really do need to explain why, having backed, rightly backed calls to extend free personal care, that they not only voted against it in our budget in this Parliament, but they're also going to cut DLA or PIP payments from Westminster, because, again, that's something else that seems to me utterly inexplicable. And Miles Briggs. Thank you, President Officer. Two years ago, I was honoured to bring forward uh, Frank's Law Bill to Parliament alongside Amanda Capel. And it's therefore welcome that we are seeing these progress made today. One key area which Alzheimer's Scotland has highlighted in their recent report, which the government haven't responded to, is around equality of access to health care for people with advanced dementia. Can I ask the Scottish Government and the First Minister, now that this will be asked by councils to deliver, what steps will ministers take to guarantee that we don't see a postcode lottery develop across Scotland? First Minister. Well, we, will, we will continue to work uh, with councils and of course we will continue to liaise with uh, organisations like Alzheimer's Scotland to make sure that people who are assessed as needing uh, personal care get that uh, and you know, I, I hope uh, all members will play their part uh, in that. Can I just take the opportunity though uh, to commend all those who have campaigned uh, for this policy, in particular Amanda Copel, who uh, I think is due a great amount of credit and gratitude from all of us for all of her efforts. Um, no doubt we'll continue to debate issues like this and issues such as uh, the one that was raised by Emma Harper, but let's for a moment perhaps on a, a note of consensus just pause to reflect on the fact that the introduction of free personal care for the over 65s was one of the proudest achievements of this parliament in its early years. And I think as we celebrate the 20th anniversary of this parliament, it is really appropriate and something that all of us across the parliament should be proud of that we're extending this policy now to the under 65s as well. And as parliaments elsewhere on these islands, uh, or a parliament elsewhere in these islands, uh, obsesses uh, with Brexit, all of us should be proud that our parliament is getting on with the socially progressive change that our country wants to see. Question number five, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will make it mandatory for local authorities to adopt care and risk management practices in light of reports that some councils are not monitoring children and young people who display harmful behaviour. First Minister. Uh, care and Risk Management, CARM, is a multi-agency framework designed to assist with the early identification, assessment and management of children aged 12 to 18 who display harmful behaviours while ensuring that their needs are met and that links are made to child protection procedures. It was produced by the Scottish Government in partnership with a wide range of expert practitioners. It is considered uh, to be best practice and should be undertaken by local authorities. Uh, however, the decision to adopt CARM is ultimately for each local authority, but we recommend recommend that they do so. Liam Kerr. I thank the First Minister for that answer. 
Last week's Sunday Times reported that the Scottish Government's policy to help social workers and police protect the public uh, from those displaying harmful behaviour was not being followed in Argyll and Butte, where Alicia McPhail was horrifically murdered. Apparently 15 other councils are not monitoring children at risk of causing harm. Now, I did ask whether the First Minister would make it mandatory to follow the policy. I'm not sure I heard that answer. So just to be sure, will the First Minister commit to mandating that councils follow the policy? And in the meantime, can the First Minister name which local authorities do not follow the policy? And will she write to those councils and urge them to adopt it? First Minister. Um, President Officer, can I uh, first take the opportunity uh, of expressing my sincere condolences and I'm sure the condolences of everybody across the chamber to the family of Alicia McPhail. Uh, none of us can even begin to imagine what her family are going through but uh, I know my thoughts are with them and I'm sure the thoughts of all of us uh, are with them at uh, what will be a difficult time and what I'm sure will continue to be a horrendously difficult time for them. Um, this is an important issue so let me just take a, a, a few moments to set out the position. Um, I think it's firstly important to say that it is not quite correct uh, to say that councils are not monitoring uh, children and young people displaying harmful behaviour. In fact, that's not correct at all. Uh, while many councils do use the specific uh, CARM guidance, others will use individual protocols to achieve the same uh, objectives. For example, Argyll and Butte Council has confirmed that while they uh, are not using the CARM guidance specifically, it does use protocols that are similar to the CARM uh, guidance. Uh, these protocols apply the same uh, approach and reflect child protection guidance. Uh, obviously, Argyll and Butte Council has undertaken an initial case review into this tragic incident and are considering whether a significant case review is required. Uh, when uh, and if that is carried out, there may well be lessons to learn from that. And if uh, one of those is around uh, CARM guidance, then that is something we will uh, reflect on. Um, but the last point I would make is that standards for youth justice are currently being developed between Scottish Government and key partners for publication in June this year. These standards will outline the minimum expectations for all services delivering youth justice and will include a standard on care and risk management. Uh, and as part of this, uh, there is uh, a consideration of updating the CARM guidance. So there is ongoing work here. But I guess uh, the, the key point I think I would urge all members to take away from this is that councils who are not using this specific guidance will be using similar protocols. Uh, and I think it's important that that assurance uh, is given both to the chamber and to the wider public. And question number six, Elaine Smith. <clears throat> Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will consider bringing forward the introduction of an income supplement in light of two recent reports predicting an increase in child poverty. First Minister. Uh, yes, we will. Uh, these reports, uh, as we've uh, reflected on previously today, show us the devastating impact of the UK government's uh, welfare cuts. Uh, they've taken uh, the avoidable and conscious decisions to drive families in Scotland and across the UK into poverty. Uh, we have committed to setting out options for the income supplement prior to the summer recess, and we will do so. Uh, and we look forward to working with members across the chamber to design and implement an income supplement that can help uh, the maximum number of children and families who need it most. Elaine Smith. Thank you, presiding officer, and I'm glad the First Minister agrees these are shocking reports and we do need to push for urgency because up to date under the SNP's watch and fueled by Tory austerity, child poverty in Scotland continues to rise and the resolution report predicts a rise of up to 29% by 2023. And presiding officer, that should be a cause of shame for every elected member in the chamber so if I heard correctly and I do hope I did I think that the, the first minister has finally listened to Labour's call for the income supplement to be brought forward we can't wait until 2022 at the earliest because as Dr Mary Ann McLeod says promises to help people in three years time are of little comfort to parents whose cupboards are empty right now but given that tackling poverty just can't wait Will the First Minister also listen to Scottish Labour, children's charities, faith groups and academics and immediately implement a £5 supplement to child benefit, which was left tens of thousands of children out of poverty right now? Or will she continue to just talk about it and take action whilst families are struggling below the breadline? You know, jam tomorrow's no use That's when families don't even have Ms. bread Smith. today. Thank you. First question. Well, signing officer, this... This is a serious issue. I'm uh, on record, not just today, but on many occasions, as saying I think poverty rates generally and child poverty rates in particular in Scotland uh, are too high. In Scotland, the child poverty rate is 22%, far too high. Uh, but it is worth noting that in the UK as a whole, it's 26%. And in Wales, uh, it's 26%. 
as well. So uh, the member's uh, assertion that this is somehow down to the SNP simply doesn't bear scrutiny. What does mark the SNP government out, I have to say, is our determination to take action to tackle child poverty. The only part of the UK now with statutory targets, uh, the mitigation we're doing uh, to protect against Tory welfare cuts and the work we are doing to look at how we have an income supplement that raises the maximum number of children out of poverty. Now, the, the reality is, whether uh, Labour members uh, want to accept this or not, the reality is we need a delivery mechanism in place for that. Uh, we need to have the budgeting to make sure we can do that. We cannot simply promise something that we don't know how it can be delivered or how it can be paid for. So we are doing the hard work now uh, to make it possible, not just in rhetoric, but in reality. And we'll bring forward the update before June of this year and Parliament as a whole can then debate the best way forward. I think that's the right way to go and I think that is uh, the way actually that is in the best interest longer term of children across Scotland. And Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I actually agree with the First Minister that we should ensure that uh, any money that's given should be targeted to those in need and not given to, as a universal benefit to many people who don't need it. But can I ask the First Minister, the introduction of an income supplement would experience the sort of economic shock factors, the volatility of the economy. So can I ask, does the First Minister believe that this is a factor that very much needs to be considered in the introduction of an income supplement, and how would the Scottish Government manage that? First Minister. I'm not, uh, forgive me, I'm genuinely not sure I entirely understand that question, but I'm happy to reflect on it and uh, reply uh, later on. Of course, when we bring forward the update uh, with suggested ways forward uh, in June, all of these issues can be properly discussed and debated. Uh, but I would say to Michelle Ballantyne, you know, in all sincerity, we wouldn't be having this discussion right now if it wasn't for the policies of her party at Westminster, imposing welfare cuts and austerity on children and families across Scotland. And perhaps if she wanted to reflect on that before she Nick stands up in this chamber to talk about child poverty, we'd all be a lot better off. Thank you very much. And that concludes the First Minister's questions. We're going to move on shortly to uh, members' business in the name of Rhoda Grant on condemnation of misogyny, racism, harassment and sexism. But we'll just have a short suspension while members, ministers and members of the gallery uh, wish to change seats. A short suspension. <laughs>